The battle with Igris and solo leveling is incredible. It's got everything I love about anime combat, a seemingly insurmountable foe, epic music, great animation, but no battle can be truly effective without having some build-up to it, and solo leveling successfully accomplishes that as well. As Jinwoo takes on this new quest, he's confronted with a single knight who's impervious to his blade strikes. He has to put away his weapon and decapitate the enemy with his bare hands, using up one of his specialty attacks. Then, in glorious anime fashion, as he's fatigued and blocked from using potions to recover, we hear the footsteps of several more armored knights approaching. Jinwoo turns towards them, a look of determination on his face. The stakes have never been higher. Then we cut to a shot of what appears to be steak on a plate. Obviously this symbolism is intentional. Unless it's not. I'm not entirely sure it's even steak. Could be pork cutlets, which would be... Regardless, it's a great way to keep up the tension of battle. Its juxtaposition gives viewers a breather from the intensity of Jin Wu's quest, while also adding to its suspense. We want to get back to the battle. That's a challenging balance to find, riding the line between keeping viewers engaged and excited, while also leaving them hungry for more. Wait a minute. Maybe that's the symbolism of this delicious food. But this dinner break acts as more than a simple reprieve from the action directly preceding it. It's also building on Jin Wu's ever growing strength. Jin Ho mentally brings this up, trailing off as he contemplates Jin Wu's insane abilities. The incomplete nature of these thoughts are not only here to emphasize the mysterious nature of our lead character's power, but also his seemingly infinite ability to progress. We're only 6 minutes and 20 seconds into the episode, and 1 minute and 30 seconds of it have been opening credits. That's some solid groundwork in under 5 minutes. When we return to the fight, Jin Wu has just finished defeating the armored knights. He's looking to finally take a break to catch his breath when he's attacked by a stealth assassin and a mage. Introducing two new types of challenges to battle. It seems to our protagonist that he's being faced with every type of opponent he's come across until this point. These fights demonstrate Jin Wu's growing versatility as a fighter. It's great to see the blending of attacks he needs to use to take each down. The dodging, blocks, and strikes he uses aren't just incredibly choreographed and fun to look at, but showcase everything he's learned. It's a culmination of a season, both reflective and looking forward. I love the slowly zooming in shot of Jin Wu, first throwing a body to deflect fire, then dodging and deflecting more attacks as the camera continues to move in, which is the best way I have of describing things. I know we aren't dealing with physical cameras here. Anyway, the emphasis is on everything he's learned. It's about how he's able to move and not about the enemies he's facing. It also adds a sense of danger to everything. Opponents are often right beyond the frame or we're so close to our main character we only have a split second to register new enemies attacking before they're on him. We then cut to a brief scene of our S-Class heroes preparing to leave on a mission back to the infested island they abandoned so long ago. A character says, the time has finally come, paralleling the culmination of Jin Wu's own journey. Back in the dungeon, we see our protagonist standing amidst a sea of bodies. It's time to begin the final boss fight. The tension builds as he slowly walks onward, dwarfed by the massive structure he's in. He reaches a pair of colossal doors and pushes through. If the previous knights, mages, and assassins he fought were references to his journey since reawakening, the boss is meant to hearken back to the seemingly insurmountable power Jin Wu faced down in the double dungeon. We even get a similar set of massive doors leading into the final boss room. Our hero immediately feels that parallel. The power wafting off of Igris gives him flashbacks to those moments before he gained the ability to level, to back when he was a helpless E-rank adventurer. What better way to bookend a season than having Jin Wu face down a similarly powerful opponent? Our main character is even wearing similar clothing to back then, though it's a much tighter fit than before. Here the tension begins to skyrocket. We catch a flash of this new enemy's headdress. We hear his footsteps, see Jin Wu's reaction to his opponent, followed by a distant shot of our hero standing in this vast throne room. He's tiny in comparison, out of his depths in this fight. We see Igris's legs as he walks out into the open to face our protagonist, all before we ever see what he actually looks like. Then, with the tension at its highest point, Igris the Blood Red is finally revealed in all his menacing glory. I love the distorted electronic music that plays in the background. It feels like speakers being overloaded, driving home this idea that the creature before us is overpowered. The camera movement is incredible, rapidly pulling away from a close-up as Igris points his sword at Jin Wu, before the creature lunges, catches up, and immediately overtakes it. He's too much for even the animators to follow. We get a great slow-motion shot as the camera pans around our characters, and things speed back up for Igris's swing. This not only looks cool, but makes our enemy's speed seem all the more daunting in comparison. It's so powerful that a pillar explodes in the background. Every strike has that same immense force behind it. Jin Wu goes flying with each impact, barely managing to escape the barrage with his life. 
When he does block an overhead blow, it's so powerful the ground shatters around him. Then we finally get a cut that just feels like it's here to break the tension so we don't pass out from the adrenaline coursing through our veins. There's some plot stuff, but nothing important for this fight. When we return, Igris immediately charges, once again moving too quickly for the camera to keep him in frame. It catches up just in time to show the overpowered knight slamming Jin Wu into the ground. We get a close-up of our main character as he's lifted back up and thrown against the far wall of the throne room. It's a great shot, emphasizing the strength of the enemy by how far he's able to throw him. The depth created in these two-dimensional sequences is spectacular. I love the way different types of shots are constantly being utilized. Distant shots, medium shots, close-ups, some track our protagonist's movements, some track his opponents, some revolve around our characters, others don't move at all. It keeps each sequence interesting. But the framing isn't bouncing around for the simple sake of variety either. It's all very intentional. Each shot flows into the next. Let's take the wall throw as an example. We get a distant shot of Jin Wu hitting the far wall, obscured in a cloud of debris. Igris starts to charge. We cut to a close-up of our hero's face reappearing through the haze. His determined look turns to fear as he sees what's coming his way. We cut to an overhead view of Igris striking Jin Wu. We cut to a close-up of the same strike, slowed down and from the side. We cut to a more distant shot as the enemy's blows begin to rain down on him, sections of the wall flying out in all directions. A cloud of debris obscures our view. When visibility returns, the camera has been repositioned in front of Igris as he pulls back for another more powerful strike. The camera reverses angles to show cracks racing up the wall from the impact and exploding outward. Every sequence is like this. The combat is clearly visible. The action is fast with numerous cuts and camera movements. But it never feels like you're losing track of what's happening. Just occasionally losing track of the actual characters as their movements defy what should be humanly possible. Though even that's done with intention. That's one of the beauties of animation. Fight sequences aren't cobbled together from multiple takes. They don't run into the same continuity issues as live action. Everything's created exactly as intended, and the intangible camera can do things no physical camera could ever do. Though I will say there are some weird physics things that go on in this one sequence where Igris is pummeling our main character. I feel like all these strikes should be sending him flying in one direction or the other, but he's just kind of hovering in place. Not that I'm complaining, it's another great looking shot and one of these strikes does cause him to bounce off the ground, so it's not like Jin Wu's completely static. The idea is to show how insanely fast our overpowered knight can move, and it signals another turning point in their battle. For a moment it felt like our main character was beginning to hold his own, only for Igris to kick things into high gear. Not to get too distracted here, but I also like how the show doesn't forget about the broken pillars in the throne room. We see them pop up in various shots, a detail that would be very easy to forget. With the fight decidedly turning against our hero, we see him slammed into the throne itself. He's beaten and practically too exhausted to move. Then we get another abrupt cut. We see Jin Wu's sister. She's made him some food and left a sweet note for him. We switch views to one of his mother lying in her hospital bed. No reason is given as to why these shots are included because it isn't necessary. We understand that these two people are the reason Jin Wu fights so hard. We return to the throne room, with Igris preparing to deal the final blow. He swings down and our hero catches the blade with his bare hand. This is when the animation takes things to a whole new level. The first hint of what's to come happens when Jin Wu stabs his opponent in the eye. Power radiates through the room, causing the very air to shiver with energy. As things progress, he drives his knife deep into Igris's throat and his eyes come alive with power. But perhaps not just power, he's seeing the world in ways he never could before, just as we're about to. The animation shifts from its standard clean lines and color, to this inverted, sketched out madness, and I absolutely love it. It's so raw and intense, a raging fire of emotion and power, breaking the animated world itself. It reminds me of one of the scenes in One Punch Man. I don't know why we don't see this style more often. While most of the epic one on one fighting is in episode 11, the final episode wraps this story up. The finale completes not only our hero's initial arc, but it sets our dispatched foe down his own path of redemption. Igris is defeated, then brought back as a shadow. He was previously a knight guarding an empty throne room, a warrior with no real purpose. Now he has a new master and a renewed reason to fight. The final episode's title is quite fitting, Arise. It was even released on Easter, a holiday all about resurrection. Not saying that's intentional, but it's certainly an interesting thing to note. These concluding episodes are brilliantly crafted. I love the parallels they have with our character's past. The way Igris radiates a power similar to that of the double dungeon that first set us on his journey. The way our hero is dressed, the dungeon itself, and all contrasting with a lead who's finally somewhat prepared for the challenge, who no longer flees from danger, but charges in to face it. 
similar situations, but with a hero who's managed to break the leveling rules of this world's ranking system and remade himself into something new. And now Jin Wu no longer has to level on his own. Until next time, peace.